So welcome to Beta Talk, which is an audio podcast, but I'm now also doing it on uh, YouTube. And you can find me at Beta Teach. And you can see the gubbins behind me where you can follow, you can subscribe, you can like, you can do all that shenanigans. I'm going to be talking about batches again today. We're going to be talking about how do you recycle them, second life. Uh, you know, are they exploitative on our resources? We've also, we, we, I'm joined by Dr. Jennifer, and I've spoke to Dr. Jennifer before. Uh, let me get this right. You lead the Electrochemical Storage Group at Specific. I'm also yeah. joined by my friend Gavin, who's uh, at the Birmingham University. Um, and you are, Gavin, uh, well, it says there, doesn't it? You're for street strategic elements and critical materials. <laughs> Uh, I always take the mickey out of Gavin because he's got about 35 letters after his name. <laughs> and we're joined by, today by Lizzie, who's doing her PhD at the University of Birmingham. And that's in uh, lithium and sodium ion batteries, I, I think. Is that right? Yeah. So today we're going to sort of expand upon what Gavin and uh, Jennifer and I talked about uh, last time. But you're doing something, Liz, and we, we discussed this a little bit, or Gavin did it. Jenga was the yeah. word. So our battery jenga. So alongside my PhD, um, we've been trying to like uh, do a bit of battery education. So we call it outreach university. So our sort of research, we try and communicate to general public, school children, just engage with what actually our research is and how is it relevant. And the battery jenga, which I've got to my side, and I can show you in a sec how it works. It kind of shows you how lithium ion batteries work. So those batteries are everywhere. You know, my laptop in front of me, smartphones. So just kind of having that link to why well, actually, how do they operate? And they do have, in outreach, they do have, you know, sort of demonstrations which kids can use and that you normally find them as like the lemon or potato electrolyte batteries. And they're really good, they're tactile. It's a great demo, demo introduced like um, circuit snap, but it, it's a non-rechargeable type, whereas lithium my batteries are rechargeable. And so we just come up with this um, demonstration using Jenga to explain how batteries work. So I can show you if you want mm. now. Yeah. Yep. So I always find a bit I rude. I want to see. Yeah. <laughs> I always find a bit rude when I show this because I turn away and you can just hear a voice you can't see me. So I'll be from the side. Uh, but before I start, I'll just give a little key. So it did start originally as our painted set. And so I'm just getting my little cards out. So in one of the electrodes, we have something called lithium carbon oxide. Um, and it's a layered structure. The blue bits here are lithium and these are layers of cobalt oxide, the purple. And in the other electrodes we have graphite and I normally talk to kids like where can you find it in the classroom and graphite they hopefully say you know in pencils. So these are the two main things I'm going to talk about and so it did start off as a painted set so that's our cobalt oxide, this is our lithium, this is our graphite. I'm going to show you some of our painted set I've got up. Uh, I've got my tactile on. So just like before, this instead will be our carbon oxide. And this will be our lithium. And uh, this will be our carbon I'm really proud of this. It's just cardboard, but you can see the rich texture which kind of represents the layers of the structural materials. Um, and we kind of just developed some of having the painted set to the tactile because then all the kids can access it. And this is like the Jenga. Yeah, this is the Jenga. Here we go. So just mention about the two electrodes. Uh, in between, you would have a liquid electrolyte, but I'm not going to focus on that. I'm just going to purely focus on what happens at the electrodes. So we'll just remove some of our blank blocks. So these white blanks just represent just the spaces between the layers. And I always just take a few out just to help kind of visualise where the things are going to go. So when you're, you know, you need to charge your phone at night, you plug it in, and what's actually happened is you're moving the lithium from this structure here. So this is our cold lithium carbon oxide, but the shiny bits here, that's what says that aluminium, and that's just what the coating's deposited on. So you start charging, and you move your lithium from your oxide electrode, and it keeps going, and you put it into your graphite. Okay, one more. And there we go. So now that's it, the charge. It's not, not an issue process. And um, so there you go. So you're going to use your phone and it starts discharging and it will go from say 100% to 0%. And it's just a reverse process. That's not supposed to happen. <laughs> reverse process that happens. And your lithiums will. I'm going to knock it like that. Your lithiums will gradually, they will make their way back over. And you would have an external circuit, but it's not represented in this one. But the external circuit is where your electrons move. 
but instead I'm just showing the movement of the lithiums. Now you can see this comes off my own demo, but I normally show you this. So this is see, a this is a good sort of like you say tactile kinesthetic yeah. thing for young people because obviously young people are using batteries constantly at the moment. I mean, yeah. there's a few of them upstairs on their phones and all sorts. But uh, this is a very very sort of good way they can understand how the, the sort of the more technical side of it, isn't it? Yeah, it just is like at least visualising it, and uh, we've done it with a range of uh, age groups. We've had it out with the general public. The youngest me and Gavin have worked with the year four or eight year olds, and we did like a sort of similar project. I suppose as long as they can take something away from, say, charging and discharging, it's more the older school children where they can actually relate it to sort of the redox electrochemical potentials. Yeah. But having that sort of tactile way is a bit different, and hopefully they will remember it. Um, we can do two other demonstrations with it if you want to show that. Yeah, you can do. Yeah, okay, so let me pop these back in. And one of the things as well, I mean, I forget about that kind of shows how batteries degrade over time, like the materials becoming you know, out of the line and not work as well as they should. So let's just pop it in. Normally these bits end up getting a bit stuck, but they're quite spider today. So on the other side, we've got another oxide electrode. So what I normally do is get one student up who's going to be our slow charge. And we sort of do this slow charge and fast charge experiment just to get them to think about rates of charge, sort of safety, and how that can apply to that application. So for example, I always say you wouldn't want to, you know, the rate of how you charge your phone, you wouldn't want to apply that to an electric vehicle because the next day it wouldn't be charged. And then I normally get another student to go really fast. And sometimes they're a bit hesitant. You don't want to let them do that. But with that, it kind of shows you need to apply your rate of charge, you know, safely. Uh, if not, you'll get structure collapse. Right. And I do like doing that. And I had one student actually. She was like, what am I supposed to do? I was like, just pull out, pull out the chart, you know, pull out the lithiums fast. And at one point, she was hand just came across, pushed it over, and I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. And um, um, I'll just go into this one, but if you keep one thing that happened earlier when I started showing you the charge discharge, things were getting locked easily. And again, what I said previously is just how you can relate to sort of degradation over time. So instead of having that where we had our perfect block, sometimes you might see the Jane go like this over time, just from moving the blocks in and out. And that's another big concept we can teach as well. But I think the rate of charge is one of my favourite ones. I like seeing the Jenga just collapse. I think everyone has. Well, I think, I think they get <laughs> That just cognitively sort of sunk in with me as well. I mean, I'm looking at my laptop thinking I've got it plugged, it's, it's being charged as I'm using it. I'm thinking, hmm, am I, am I ruining the battery by doing that? I can't. I never remember the advice on that, so I'm going to actually unplug it now. <laughs> but um, so it's simple concepts like that that get people to understand battery technology. And you've mentioned like pushing it over that, and that's when the structural integrity of a battery can sort of diminish. And this is something that you two research, isn't it? Sort of second life, recycling. I mean, mm -hmm. when, a, when a battery comes to sort of the, the, the end, let's say, in an EV vehicle, it can be used in other applications, can't it? Yes, yeah. and, and this is one area that we research. There's obviously two ways to sort of improve the lifetime of a battery and make it last longer. One is by um, advising the consumer how to best charge it. But as you just said then, you can't remember what the advice should be. Yeah. It will, can actually be different for different sorts of batteries. Um, and also, if you're taking an EV and you're going on holiday and you need to charge it, you're, you want to charge it fast, regardless of um, whether that's the best thing for its 20 year lifetime. You're just worried about getting where you want to go tonight. So the other thing that we do look at is, um, you know, how can we understand how materials degrade and how do the batteries degrade? And then look at, well, how can we manufacture them in ways that they will last longer? Um, and that could be adjustments in how they're manufactured, but also adjustments in the chemistries that we use. Um, and a parallel group to my team looks at um, in situ measurements of batteries charging and discharging, because although we have, we do understand some of the mechanisms, um, obviously taking a battery apart it, it, then you've taken it apart and it doesn't look exactly like it did you know um, beforehand so if you can actually measure and, and understand what's happening while the uh, battery is cycling that can give you very useful information to say 
these are the things that we want to change in future. Um, but the other side of the equation where you asked about second life batteries, in fixed energy storage, we have a lot more power to say, use them in this manner. And in fact, some of the fixed energy lithium ion batteries are being offered with um, much longer cycle lives than your car. And that's not necessarily because they're particularly different um, batteries, but it's because they can be um, cycled with very strict controls on the rates of charge and discharge, and also the temperature they're kept at. So one of the problems with fast charging is not just that things are moving about quickly, as, as Lizzie demonstrated, but also that you're generating a lot of heat. And heat management is something that there's a lot of work going on um, in the electric vehicle market. How can you cool the batteries down when you're charging them? Um, but the other option in the stationary market is to just say, let's just keep that charge rate slow or that discharge rate slow and plan for the battery to be used in a much more benign environment and that will in improve its lifetime. I just want to pick up, so obviously we, we, most people will know the world famous battery manufacturer, you know, quite a famous person. Do, do they engage with new universities on all this sort of stuff or do they take, undertake their own studies and just get on with it and manufacture batteries or are they actually listening to sort of like people like yourselves and you know, or, or they just got their own researchers? Are you talking about Tesla or? Uh... I, I was talking about Tesla. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think Tesla have quite a long-standing relationship with um, uh, an American um, institution that I've now has just completely gone out of my mind. That actually some of the work you know came from there. Um, uh, there obviously is a lot of in-house. Um, development um, in SAMHSA and Cattle, who are a big um, battery manufacturer in China, although they may not be so well known of, of here. Um, but there is also engagement back um, and with the end users and probably I'll pass on to Gavin for that. So Nissan particularly engage a, a lot. Um, and obviously in the UK, you know, our engagement is more, you know, on the where there are local companies and we have a lot of great local startups uh, and beyond startups uh, in advanced battery technologies but maybe the end of life Gavin be interested in you done some work with Nissan I think. Yeah so, so I mean I think when you look at the technological landscape it's always a case that you've got sort of large incumbent firms and then you've got sort of insurgent firms that are trying to disrupt that landscape and I think universities tend to mix work with a mixture of both um so yeah through our relib project um one of our partners is newcastle university um, newcastle's obviously very close to nissan and their massive um, manufacturing plant in sunderland first sort of big battery plant in the uk and so we've got a really good relationship with them through the newcastle link but then obviously you know there's other vehicle manufacturers in the west midlands and, and nearby and I think for the UK at the moment, the challenge is really trying to attract um, a massive scale of battery manufacturing operation to the UK as a sort of anchor company. Uh, in some work by the Faraday Institution on the sort of demand for lithium ion batteries in the future and, and how many they anticipate that we're going to need and the sort of manufacturing capacity that we'd need to develop in order to produce those batteries because obviously there's an opportunity to create jobs and growth and it'd be really great to capture some of that in the UK rather than just buying stuff in from abroad. Are we starting to see that happening? Um, I think there's lots of different conversations that are going on. Um, I mean I think if you look maybe more broadly across Europe Mm. You can see that there's been a lot of development of battery manufacturing um, in different European countries. I think, you know, it's a, it's a challenge in the UK. There's lots of different factors around what make manufacturing destinations um, attractive. And obviously there's been a lot of investment by UK government into battery innovation and research and really trying to create knowledge and IP in the UK that's sort of valuable to industry. 
but I think you know you can't help but look at sort of things around the automotive industry, uncertainty around the future. Um, Brexit obviously plays a big factor in that in terms of not knowing what the access to the European market is going to look like. And so, um, you know, I think, you know, we saw, you mentioned Tesla earlier, and um, we saw sort of Elon Musk um, talk about, you know, citing these Gigafactory in Berlin and yeah. the different factors that, that led to that. So I think, um, you know, it's a, it's a challenging landscape at the moment, but I think there's a lot of uh, innovation in the UK. There's a lot of really good ideas. And I think it's partly about, um, you know, having the best ideas, having the latest technological developments to make the best products. But it's also about having the resources to be able to manufacture lithium ion batteries. And the challenge that we've got is that many of the critical materials that we need for a battery manufacturing supply chain, um, with the exception of potentially a little bit of lithium that could be produced in Cornwall, um, things like cobalt, etc. Um, we would have to import and develop the capacity to be able to um, process that and, and make that into finished product. I want to, I want to talk about, because obviously when we talk about batteries and, and, and the production of batteries, cobalt does sort of tend to come up. It's got sort of a bit of a bad sort of uh, rep behind it. Um, I mean, as far as I know, cobalt is, uh, is used to actually remove sulphur from, from petrol. I think you would know something about that, Jen. So it's, uh, it's used in other industries that perhaps people don't know about. Uh, that we're using all the time. Um, I mean, what's, what is going on with the whole cobalt thing at the moment? Um, sorry, I've just got an alarm. Oh, it's just finished the alarm going off in the background there. Um, yeah, you're right. Cobalt is used in, in other industries and yeah, ironically is used um, to make catalysts that remove sulfur from uh, petrol. It is battery use now with the exponential increase in uh, the volume of batteries being manufactured that's becoming you know the biggest requirement for it but there are also uh, many non non cobalt um, formulations um, so in fact the early Nissan leaves didn't have any cobalt in them if you've got a 2012 to 2014 15 Nissan leaf there's no cobalt in that a lot of the formulations uh, for electric buses tend to be uh, cobalt free. And also there's a big um, driver uh, um, to look at um, uh, cobalt sources that are certified as from, um, I won't say sustainable sources, but from um, fairly manufactured and gain sources. And um, I know Jackie Murray from uh, who's the director of the Faraday Challenge, who we mention a lot because, you know, the Faraday Challenge is what's funding a lot of the research in, in the UK. So it's it's come from government, but that's how they've sort of decided to distribute the funding. And, you know, she, she's got involved with understanding these supply chains and we, the battery industry is held to account in a way that other industries aren't necessarily. Um, I think that's a good thing. It highlights where we need to work, but that's not a reason to not choose a battery car over a petrol driven car. It might be a reason to go car free. I am not. Uh, would never dispute that, but um, I think it's trying to make sure that we're looking on the same level. And certainly all the drivers are to reduce the cobalt formulation um, in lithium ion batteries, but also when we look beyond lithium ion, and both Lizzie and myself work not just on lithium ion, but on sodium ion batteries, which um, don't tend to have cobalt in the formulation. You then don't need to look for a lithium source. Sodium is much more um, readily available. Um, but there still are issues. So those batteries are, for the most part, in the lab still, um, because there are issues with um, energy density. Um, but there are actually in, in India, sodium batteries are being very much promoted because they also don't have a lithium source themselves in, in, in India. And so they're looking and they already are developing uh, sodium ion batteries for um, bus transport. So again, where, you know, it's not a high performance car, it's not somebody who's looking to charge very quickly. It's the bus, buses doing known routes and known charging times. Um, and so, I think that's where the technology will get its sort of trial um, and it may be and for my part I'm looking at these formulations for stationary storage as well because although we expect to get some second life from car batteries one they're not available now 
Um, and secondly, I hope those batteries will stay in cars and actually the ideal will be, you know, um, Tesla have already suggested they have got batteries that will do a million miles. And I, I don't dispute that. I think that certainly there's been evidence to show that, you know, these batteries can last a long time. And it might be we get to the crazy scenario where the batteries are outlasting the car and that, you know, you buy your Tesla and at the end of life for the Tesla, those batteries don't go into a second life, but go into, you know, your Nissan micro application or, or whatever. Now, I'm not saying that is currently on the cards, but I think the technology has moved on so fast in the last 10 years. It really is, you know, difficult to predict where it will go in the next 10 years especially you know now we're in a, a time of a lot of uh, disruption with covid which may or may not be good for um you know electric cars depending on what impetus governments put in you know when we're trying to move out of this crisis so going back to Liz, lizzie you, you when you do this outreach program obviously you've got yeah. different age groups um do they ever ask you some of these young people what the difference between a sodium ion and a lithium ion battery is and how would you elucidate that Ah, so really we don't normally get asked that um, because I think when it comes to the sort of curriculum, lithium sort of mentioned as a sort of add-on for application. Um, but when I did do uh, a lecture back in January, I did mention the sodium because it ties in nicely with my work. But really, from what I just showed you, the sort of interpolation with the lithium going from one electrode to the other, that sort of chemistry applies the same for sodium. You just have to get a different sort of anode. Uh, but really no one really asked about that and I, I mean I did um, a sort of survey as well uh, we did like a before and after the lecture and it was quite nice to see that when I asked about the sort of lithium they're also putting the sodium in too uh, but no I don't know if it's widely known. Is, is, I mean is I mean, one of the first questions people always ask what are the benefits over one or the other and I mean has, has one got particularly good benefits that we should be using? Do you want to add to that or do you want to answer that, Jen? Yeah, go, go for it, Liz. Oh, okay, well, so I think Jen sort of mentioned it as well with sodium. So lithium at the moment, it's got so much, there's not a lot of reserves where it say it might last for the next 50 years. Whereas sodium, it's abundant. Even, you know, in the oceans, you've got sodium chloride, the salt, and mm. that can tie in with the cost. Whereas if you're looking for, and I suppose also it relates to sort of application. So if you're going for an electric vehicle, you want something lightweight, high power. But with sodium, it is slightly down on the period table from lithium just one below so a little bit heavier so if you could go for something that's a large storage application where weight's not really an issue it does the same job as lithium then that would be perfect and then you could leave the lithium or you will say high power electric vehicle resources hmm. would you guys agree <laughs> uh, yeah so yeah. i can see gavin talking but i can't <laughs> hear him Sorry, I, I was going to say, Nathan, um, I don't know. Ah, screen sharing is disabled, that's a shame. <laughs> i show you a diagram um, of a circular economy of lithium-ion batteries because, I think, as, as Jen says, there's a real hierarchy of different applications, um, you know, and, and different battery chemistries have got different performance criteria on a range of different axes. You know, um, Lizzie was talking about energy density by weight, energy density by volume, safety, durability, and all of these different cathode chemistries have got different um, performance criteria. And electric vehicles are very demanding because obviously you've got to put so much power into a small space, it's got to be lightweight in order to deliver the range. And you haven't got that challenge with energy storage in a stationary application so much, you know. It's, um, it's easier to accommodate maybe slightly bulkier batteries. But I think what we need to consider is what's the best way to make use of resources. So at the end of a battery's life, um, it may be that um, if you look at the whole battery pack, um, some of the modules are particularly bad, others are okay. So it could be that we can remanufacture battery packs and give them a second life um, in you know, in electric vehicles again. So you could imagine someone with a slightly older car, it's a little bit careworn, the interior is a little bit tatty, it's too good to scrap, um, but they're happy to put up with a slightly diminished performance, but it needs a new battery. You might buy a remanufactured part rather than a brand new pack, which obviously entails a lot of expense or cost. Then of course, there's thinking about, can a battery have a second life in a stationary application? And there's thinking about recycling. But there's a little bit of a tension there because we spoke about cobalt earlier 
and how it's in scarce supply. And you can imagine a scenario in which we face a sort of cobalt crunch where demand for cobalt in electric vehicles really starts to take off and that outstrips supply. And there's a challenge there in terms of what's the best use of resources. Do we tie up all of that cobalt in really, really high performance electric vehicle batteries that have degraded slightly and aren't at their best and that resource is tied up in a warehouse somewhere? Um, or do we maybe recycle those batteries sooner and turn them into fresh batteries with top performance? So I think, you know, there's a bit of a debate to be had there. I was going to say, can you can you screen share yet? Because I um I've, I've changed something. Uh... Let's let's see if I can make this work. Oh, there we go. So, so can you see that? Yeah. Yep. Brilliant. So like this, if you start up in the top left hand side, yep. You can imagine you know a vehicle being sold by a manufacturer. Um, the consumer takes hold of that vehicle and it might mean that at some point during the lifetime of that vehicle there's a midlife battery replacement. Um, but at the end of life that vehicle needs to be dismantled and disassembled. Um, we need to find ways to take battery packs out and process them. So we're looking at robotics and automation within the Relive project as an efficient way to deal with the amount of batteries that we anticipate um, coming through the system. And then we've got this thing called gateway testing. So um, we've got this end of life battery, but we're not quite sure how well it performs. And so it's about performing tests on the battery to try and understand, is it a relatively good pack that needs a few tweaks to remanufacture it and to go back into a vehicle? Um, or if it's not quite good enough for that, it might be good for a second life application. And you can see there, you know, a bunch of batteries stacked up in a building connected to the grid. Um, but then if it's not good for either of those applications, it will need recycling. And then certainly at the end of second life applications, you know, once the battery's really had a hard life, it will eventually need recycling. And then from there, there's a variety of different processes um, which we can use to extract the materials um, and, and make more battery cathode, which in turn goes into cells, modules, and then gets integrated into packs, um, which hopefully will go into new vehicles. Gateway testing, is that a simple process or is that um, complex? Um, we're looking to make it more simple. Um, I think at the moment it's a process that's quite um, time consuming with some of the techniques that are available at the moment. I think partly also it's the fact that the processes at the moment are manual. Um, so we're looking at trying to design robotics and automation to be able to do that process on a large scale and test lots of packs quickly. And I think also there's opportunities in terms of designing battery packs for recycling. So at the moment, um, manufacturers keep a lot of their data proprietary um, about their battery management systems and about the state of health and state of charge of the batteries. And if we had some sort of standard or if we were able to access that information more rapidly. So, you know, once before the, before the battery gets taken out of the vehicle, you know, there's vehicle diagnostics, there's information on the vehicle. If we can access that information about where the battery was at before it was taken out, it would make the process of reuse and recycling uh, much easier. How are you getting on with that? Are, they, are the manufacturers listening to you? with that? Because you obviously need that information, don't you? Yeah, I think there's a little bit of a tension at the moment. I mean, I think obviously automotive manufacturers face a lot of different pressures from a lot of different angles. Mm. You know, in terms of trying to stay profitable, obviously at the moment they're under um, a special pressure with the pandemic where they've been shut, production lines have been mothballed, no vehicles have been rolling off the line. And so in a world of sort of conflicting priorities where an industry is struggling to adapt to the enormous change of um, you know, transitioning away from internal combustion engine towards batteries. I think this is something that figures you know, lower down the pecking order of priorities at the moment. Um, and it's a shame, really, because I think there's a great opportunity. But I think there will be a natural convergence as numbers start to ramp up. Um, and I think it's one of those things about the sort of maturing of regulatory regimes and the sort of legal structures that govern um, the use of batteries in vehicles and stationary power. I want to go, I mean, that diagram, obviously we had the second life applications, which is probably 
uh, where I sort of, it, in my industry, the heating industry and sort of uh, keeping homes comfortable with uh, PV going into it. But the actual diagram you just showed mate, did actually look like it, it was recyclable at all sorts of aspects of the journey. And we can do quite a lot with this battery technology and just and, and keep recycling it. Is that right? Have I got that right? I think that's where we want to move towards. I mean, I think at the moment, um, you know, there's a real market for second life um, electric vehicle batteries, batteries that come out of cars. Um, you know, people are selling them through a sort of informal economy. I mean, you can find them on auction sites like eBay. Um, there are people that are buying them in big numbers for sort of industrial installations. So I think that market is developing. Um, and well, to some degree is already very well developed. You know, you've got hobbyists and people making um, kit cars with EV motors and batteries and retrofitting classic cars. So I think, you know, it's a very interesting economy that can grow around with you know, our batteries. But what we need to do is ensure the circularity so that when things really reach the end of their life, um, we do something useful with them. And, well, and there's actually um, formal uh, companies as well, Traherne, quite close to us in based in south wales so they are looking to you know recycle batteries as well and and when we talk about recycling batteries now at the very early stage there are also batteries that come off the production line that don't meet the standards um i i don't know what proportion of those that are but you know having worked on a manufacturing line where you never get you know in a new technology 100 percent conformance is you know is unlikely and so some of those batteries actually, so they haven't had a life, but they didn't meet whatever safety requirements or, you know, they are very tight requirements can maybe go um, back in to be sort of uh, remanufactured into something else. So that, that's another source that it, it's not a very big source, but at the moment, as Gavin says, the, the industry is sort of still taking baby steps. Um, and in fact, we've done some work with Ford and one of their biggest issues was, you know, we can't get the second hand batteries to do some of these second life experiments we want to do. So th there are some of them and, and they are, you know, trickling through. But at the moment, that's limiting things. But um, yeah, I think it's there is some quite exciting, innovative work happening. And uh, I think uh, Kevin Sharp, that a few of us follow on Twitter as well, some of the work is doing fitting them. Uh, fitting batteries from so not necessarily from um, BEVs but um, from hybrid vehicles and uh, putting those into um, you know second life petrol vehicles um, you know is something that is you know part of this circular economy where we sort of say well where can things still have value and, and how can we realize that value. What, we, we talk about this circular economy what about the people that are making um, batteries from cells that they're finding from computers. I think there's, they can, they're buying them off eBay, loads and loads of cells, and they're making these little big battery packs for, for homes to work with their PV systems. Um, what, what, I mean, is that part of the sort of this circle of economy? I mean, is that something that's promoted within the battery industry? Um, I don't know within the battery industry. I think this, this is exactly sort of the sort of thing that you need within the circular economy, but there is an issue with batteries in to sort of ensure that that's safe. And I think at the moment it's happening informally. Um, I'm not saying the people who are doing it aren't safe, they probably are because they know, but there's a danger of, you know, when people then put that on YouTube and say this is really easy and then other people copy it. Um, what you can then end up with legislation that says that's illegal to do. There isn't at the moment, um, I'm not saying it, you know, and I think what we need to figure out is how can we make these things um, still be possible but be safe. So that may involve, you know, um, people setting up workshops that people can visit and having standard protocols where you would, so that the people are coming in with labour, you know, because essentially that's why they can do it at a lower cost because their labour is free and it's a high labour intensive at the moment and that's again what Gavin was looking at how can they make it less labour intensive um, but I think there is a danger particularly when you start getting to, to big powers but you know I mean I, I do experiments you know are typically on a you know 3.4 volt 
cell um you know producing less than milliamps you know and even that i'll have a risk review i'll make sure it's safe um i'll make sure everybody's got the right ppe and you know we'll make sure we're following procedure i think there is a danger if people start bringing together a lot of batteries um that that can be an issue but the principle is is right it's just making sure that the practice can can happen in a way that's not detrimental to people i think um yeah i mean i i did a did a podcast the other day with some people involved in agile tariffs and, and, and a guy i know called homely energy so we can see a scenario where people will have lots of battery banks to to extract the sort of cheap electricity that the, the system knows is going to be happening the next day and you know you, there may be um obviously you've got your small diys that are going to make their little battery packs but you could get to a situation where people are going to be making really really big stuff uh, to, to, to extract that uh, quite cheap electrical energy and then sort of put it back into the grid profit. And obviously, I, I suppose at the moment, I wouldn't know, there's no sort of overarching sort of um, body or association sort of making sure that's done sort of quite safely, is there? I don't think. I don't know. I mean, it's to be fair, after this, I'm going to go and have a Google or at least remind myself to have a look on Monday morning. But I think it's something that I would expect would be covered in the same rules that say, you know, you can't rewire, your, rewire your house your, yourself or put a shower in. At one time you were able to, only a few people did. Then there were DIY programs and everybody tried to rewire the shower on a Saturday morning and, and then they decided nobody can do any work in the bathroom. And, and I think it probably will be one of those that goes through a similar route. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I think if it's not attached to the grid, then there probably aren't any regulations against yeah. it. Um, yeah. But I certainly would advise people to take caution and probably not do it. But that's, I don't know, Gavin, you're nodding or thoughtful. Have you done this in your shed? But you're quite qualified. So. Well, we can't hear you, Gavin. Sorry there. Yeah, I think it's one of those things, you know, there's, there's real challenges around regulation. And I think, um, you know, it's partly about standards. There's lots of things that you can do. Is it desirable that people do it? And, you know, what happens in terms of liability? Say someone builds a battery and it's homebrew and it's in their own house. You know, it's one thing if something goes wrong and they cause problems for themselves. But what happens if they sell that house on or is their home? insurance valid or you know if the house burns down um, what would their mortgage provider say and I think there's a whole basket of different regulatory issues that we need to unpick around home energy storage and it's certainly something that we're looking into at the moment at Birmingham um, trying to give that some consideration not just from the point of view of people that are doing homebrew stuff but I think even from what's coming out of the industry I mean we've had um, conversations last week and, and people were saying about things you know being done with the utmost regard to safety um, and fire safety and all the rest of it but I think you know these are really highly energetic um, devices and I think there are some real questions about you know even depending on the enclosure is it desirable to have them in the cup under your stairs or should it be something that's kept outside of the home um, so I think yeah these are all things that need investigation and consideration. Do you discuss safety and fire, fire uh, with the sort of young people coming to the outreach programmes, Lizzie? Um, trying to think, have I? Uh, I sometimes relate it to sort of maybe the rate of charge. Um, I don't think I've mentioned it much. No, normally I focus just mainly on the chemistry. Yeah. But I suppose that is something we can consider. I suppose the one thing that I don't want to do is just scare the kids into be like, I don't want to use these devices and mm. get nerves about leaving phones plugged in. But I suppose that probably someone where we can integrate it in that they can learn about safety and not scare them. So yeah, I could definitely, I'll definitely look into that. I mean, the safety one is quite interesting because it was after a conversation I had with Gavin, Jennifer and, and Mark from ASON uh, last time. And, you know, I'm reasonably astute in this sort of area, not, not particularly an expert at all, but I then realised, yeah, it's not so much the batteries that could catch us, the actual charges. If the charges are sort of coming from like, um, you know they're not sort of branded charges for instance so yeah i made all the kids switch all their charges off at night time there whereas usually they'd be charging their phones at night time and it's little because i mean there is some obviously some safety stuff with all this big powerful equipment isn't there um 
I, I think there is. I think there's also an issue of different types of quality for different markets. So, I, I mean, I think um, there's been a lot of work by Newcastle University looking at battery safety. And I think, you know, the sort of batteries that you find in electric vehicles that are made, you know, to very high standards tolerances, they're very high quality batteries, are very different to say something that you might find in a cheap e-cigarette or second-hand or phone replacement battery where it's not necessarily branded in some cases they're finding that people are taking sort of um you know, failed cells that are branded and you know re-wrapping them with a generic label and on selling them there's a variety of different sort of sharp practices that go on and, and as you say if you can combine a sort of slightly faulty battery with a charger that isn't necessarily up to spec um, there's a bit of a recipe for disaster but I think you know that's different from looking at high quality cells that are in electric vehicles obviously there are still um, some safety issues that need consideration there as well but I think in terms of relative risk you know we're already used to managing petrol diesel which in itself yeah. is very dangerous you know we use LPG cylinders for barbecues and, and stuff like that so you know people can be responsible people can manage that risk and i think it's about relative risk as well that we used to use in fossil fuels and they have impacts um and actually although you know there are a number of incidents that people cite and i think as jen says you know the electric vehicle industry because it's the challenger it gets hold, held to a much higher standard um we don't look at the sort of comparison with all the accidents and, and Thoughts that are arising from petrol cars with rusty petrol tanks, for example. Now, I know we touched on this uh, last time as well. So, obviously, transport, you know, the combustion engine, and that, that's been looking for a long, long time to go to EV. And we were talking about have developers, you know, big, big house developers, are they engaging with you universities about battery technology within the homes yet, or not bothered? And I should imagine it's the latter. <laughs> Um, well, I think they do tend to be very conservative. Um, at uh, Swansea, and in specific, we um, have focused around buildings and actually spun out of that the Active Building Centre, who are mm. were set up with government funding and industry funding um, to look specifically at new builds and how they go um, zero carbon, so that not only are they not impacting on the grid when you put a new uh, building site up but they're actually supporting the grid at times of peak power um, so there there has been engagement I'm not um, directly involved with that so I can't talk about all the details and certainly um, there's been investigation so there is um, uh, some um, community housing that's been built uh, by the Pobble Group in uh, Swansea. Well, it's actually in Neathport Talbot. Um, I think Pobble are overarching the, the different areas. It's, um, I think about 16 social housing, or social houses, and that then the design of those had input from specific in the active building center, but obviously also had to meet cost requirements and also, you know, householder requirements. So, um, they're all social housing, but some for different people's needs, some disabled, um, some flats, some more family homes. Um, and they also needed to be not so techy. You know, I mean, most people who've got a battery in their home, you know, probably would describe themselves as a bit techy. They're not things that people are buying, you know, who aren't engaged with this. Um, and it's one danger that we have when we have looking at data coming from people who have batteries in their homes um, or other renewable technologies, you know, heat pumps and engaging with these uh, octopus tariffs and things like that, is that they're not necessarily sort of using it as what the general public will when we get to millions of these in operation. So in this housing estate, the data will come from people who've chosen to live in those homes because number one, they need somewhere to live. That's the number one priority on them, that they get into the top of the social housing register and that these are nice places to live, but they're not choosing it because of the technology. 
However, that's a bonus. Well, hopefully they will find it a bonus. They may report back and say, this is a nightmare, you know, and that's an important thing that we understand how are they for people to live in. And so there, the initial thought was to have one large battery. We thought that technically would work better. Um, so one large battery for the 16 houses. But actually, um, along the discussions, um, and as I say, I wasn't involved in sort of these decisions, but um, maybe for less technical reasons and more social reasons and economic reasons, um, that they decided to have the batteries in the individual homes. So they've got Tesla power walls in each home. Um, to look at the balancing um, so it will be very interesting those homes are starting to get built now so it will be very interesting to see how they go so there are household uh, house builders who are engaged but I would say only on a very low level um, and I think you know it's a risk for them making money and at the moment they're not able to get the premium we lost the zero carbon homes initiative that Gordon Brown brought in and you know it's difficult to get something something back um and you know it's i guess a difficult industry and and one that sort of is nervous of risk and and one thing that we are looking at is what can happen off site and looking at modular builds because that makes it a lot easier to bring in something new than trying to have people on site who are fitting something that they've never tried before yeah. You know, obviously, you, you know, even if you know how to do it, if it's your first or second one, you're going to be slower and being slower costs you money. Um, and so those are the things that, you know, we are engaging, but it's it's difficult. Um, but yeah, at least it's a positive that they yeah. are engaging. I think. That's the start. Everything has to start yeah. somewhere. Does it? I just want to talk about this because obviously we've heard you discuss it with the active building, which is something particularly too specific yeah. isn't it what 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 does that do what, what what's its sort of uh, mission yeah so basically the mission is to have a building that um, generates stores and releases its own energy um, and so the idea is um, that they work with pv generation but with heat pumps as well um, and then the storage we're testing different storage technologies so we're testing lithium iron we're testing, um, we're just installing a flow battery actually as soon as we're allowed back onto site. Um, and also, as I said, so my group's the electrochemical group. Um, we've got another group led by a guy called John Elvins who leads a thermal storage group. And he is looking at methods. So we do some traditional thermal storage, which is just a big tank of hot water. Yeah. Um, but also he's looking at interseasonal um, thermal storage using salts. So um, what we do is we package all these up into well our first building we made in 2016 which we call the active classroom it is basically a classroom where we teach master's students and uh, phds and hold seminars um, there's also a little office there and that incorporates all these technologies um, but it was pretty much hand built with a lot of phds <laughs> um, and probably wasn't so reproducible so our next building was then the active office, um, which is a two story building right next door. So um, if I, I can share my screen actually. Uh, so this is what was going to be my background. I'll, I'll show it in. Uh, um, can you, see, has that worked now? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So um, I'll move out of the way. <laughs> you don't have my, so my computer's not. Oh, and it's not rotated. So is this where you work? Uh, yeah, so I actually work in a building off the way, but some of my colleagues have, so I'm just going to rotate it because it's the, the, the wrong way around and you... Uh, uh... So while you're doing it, the thermal storage you were saying, and they were sort of, you, you mentioned salts, you know, is that PCM phase change material? Is that, yes, is that, yeah. uh, sorry, no, it's not phase change material. So, um, I'm having all sorts of trouble <laughs> at the moment. Um, yeah, it's not phase change material. So it's just hydrated and dehydrated salt. So it's very cheap medium to do yeah. that. Um, and I really am just moving off the side here. Um, so it's a yeah, very cheap medium. But what we're looking at, the issues currently are energy density. So that's something that we're, we're working on um, at the moment. And we work with uh, Tata Steel on that. 
and um, other companies because it, it's got a lot of potential. Um, but we need to get the energy density uh, much better than it is at the moment. There's some uh, lovely meadow flowers there, not that I know. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, so we look at, I've still not got the right aspect. So when you come, you'll feel like it's upside down. But the smaller one you can see is the um, active office. So that one was built first. Um, and so this sloping roof here is um, all photovoltaics. So it's been designed, we had an architecture who, architect who's now our um, head of building design, but she sort of joined an engineering team at a university with, uh, you know, and uh, embraced us and sort of explained why we can't, you know, engineers tend to design things for function, which is all very well, but then sometimes you do need things to as well look desirable if people are spending a lot of money on them. So that's what she brought to it. And, and she's really, um, is now writing some design standards for architects to bring in these technologies. So, you know, I, I think I saw something somebody posted on Twitter was, you know, where am I gonna put all the other gubbins for my heat pump? I've been left this tiny small cupboard to stick them all in. Yeah. And it's those sort of things that, you know, if an architect can be aware that they need, you know, even if the building won't have a heat pump on day one, yeah. that there's somewhere where it can be retrofitted. That's, if, yeah. you know, so that's what she's working on. It's a big it's, problem. It's a big problem, yeah. Ar architects, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just assume we're going to stick a boiler in a, in a cupboard in the kitchen and that don't give any uh, thought to what, you know, what could be done and what space could be. You know, yeah, well, so ho in. hopefully Joe's design guy will change all that. She's uh, been working on it manically. Uh, so this second building has actually curved PV. So this has been manufactured by a company that originally spun out of... Um, Swansea University, the building uh, integrated PV, BIPV Co it's called. Um, and so these are laminated onto steel sheets, which can be, you know, then installed just the same way you install normal um, roofing panels. So the idea has been to make these as similar to normal buildings as possible. And so these, this lovely gold color here is one of uh, Tata Steel's color coat uh, new coatings um, so that's something so we work with them to sort of showcase new technologies and, and the idea is that we showcase um, a lot of technology from startups so we've got I don't know if you've heard of Naked Energy so their oh tubes, yeah the PVT system yeah. yeah so we've got their tubes all on this side and we're seeing how they work um, collecting data from that so we're very keen to sort of trial you know we test technologies we've developed ourselves but we also test you know we'll test anybody's technologies you know within reason but um, have you got you good know, data yet on um like you know the pvt system because you know i'm quite interested in that because that's for anyone that's listening to this it's, it's photovoltaic that's kept being kept cool which makes it more efficient and then you can actually use that thermal energy uh some other way can't you Yes, so we, we do have data on it. I'm not up to date on it, but it is something I think we'll hope to publish on shortly. Um, uh, it's partly, so we can't, are collecting all the data remotely at the moment, but I've not had time to, mm. to go through it. It's one of my colleagues who sort of is collecting that. But yeah, I mean, the first year, I think we were looking at, you know, how much we exported, how much we imported and, you know, keeping that to net zero. There's no gas connections on these. That's been critical to our work that, you know, there's no point attaching new buildings to, to gas and then having to go in the future, we'll have to remove this. You know, it may be that all, some old buildings need to go to hydrogen, but the idea of a new one, it's just not worth the additional, you know, retrofit cost. Um, so, yeah, that, that's what we're working on. And then the next stage is now using this, development to sort of advise house builders and put in some features of these so certainly that's the feedback we've had from house builders is they want to see demonstrations um, they want to go and touch something they don't want to see a report on how this thing could work or couldn't work they want to go and see the building you showcase um, these buildings then do you yeah so um the idea for the first building uh, um, that we built in 2016 was to have it ready for the british science festival um, so yeah, we do showcase those and um, I can send you a link to put up so you can go and walk around these buildings virtually uh, mm -hmm. today. 
Right. So, um, and have a look and there's sort of, you can click on things and it tells you about the different technologies. Um, but although they are people's places of work, we do regularly show people around, um, you know, and uh, that's something, you know, we're quite proud to do and, uh, you know, it's something that we, we want as many people. So there's, there's often, seminars held in there you know evening ones where i want to ask i want to ask gavin he's probably on site again but gavin nod if you have have you have you actually been to it yes yes yeah brilliant yeah. Building. And, Is it, uh, have you been? No. I, I, I went i went to the so i went the larger one was under construction when i visited it was just the active office and uh active classroom and yeah brilliant tour around some really interesting technologies in there well, I'll have to. We'll have to go and visit yeah, you, cool. Brandon. <laughs> yeah, when you're uh, when you're allowed to travel, yeah, come down. But as I say, as a, as an interim, we've made this virtual tour so um, people can see and and you know get an idea of it. But uh, th there's nothing like actually walking up to it and seeing it. And bit, you know, I love teaching in the active classroom because it's so bright. And mm. also, often I'm teaching, you know, some type of subject that's that's uh, related to some of the technologies in there so it's really nice to be able to stand there and sort of point at things and um yeah. all, all the sort of um engineering is on show deliberately so people can see you know um the ducting and and the you know what's wired up and we've got temperature sensors all the way up the wall so that we can see if we're getting stratification you know and so that so although these buildings have been built to work well you know we're still improving on them and the energy use of the active office has reduced as we've understood you know how certain systems weren't actually set up you know some things weren't set up as they were designed and you know so we still have you know there's still plays that we can make them better and i think that's the one of the good things about having the engineers who designed them working in them because they're there every day to sort of go okay we can change this we can actually improve beyond our initial design plan so mm. engineers love doing that don't they yeah <laughs> but, but the second thing is we do love doing that we must do that for the first few but then we must give a building and, and a design that does need that that's obviously the ultimate goal uh, yeah. and that's where the work i think with the pobble houses comes in that you know these will be sort of you move in and and you just live in it like a normal home oh, and is that this is that this this coming sort of is that 2021 the, the pobble houses is a bit more? Uh, so i think they're already building them at the moment i think planning went through last year so i i haven't had a recent update with covid and things but um, I think people were supposed to be moving into them um, sort of September type time, but I'd need to double check that. Mm. Oh, that's uh, interesting to look uh, forward to then, isn't it? Uh, um, yeah, so. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up there with my guests, and we've obviously got lots more to, to come back to and talk to. Obviously, I'm going to want to talk to Jenna about DVT at some point. Um, uh, is there a is there a YouTube they can go to, Lizzie, for like for the young people to or anyone to see your Jenga system or some uh, of the stuff you've done? Yeah, so hopefully next of the day. So I submitted it to an education journal. And hopefully they accept it. Uh, if not, I'll put it online somewhere else. But um, I have written a paper about the activity uh, two weeks ago. I got the videos together for it, and there's um, and it, in the there's an information on how to actually do it yourself with like stickers that you can print off. So fingers crossed, and I'll link that once. And it's I can over. link. I can link that in my description for this particular video as well. Yeah, and hopefully if it gets accepted, I'll link you to it, but yeah. <laughs> and I suppose I should really also link in that active uh, office's little virtual walk around as well. Yeah, yeah really. I can send you that. Yeah. I'm not linking anything that you want as well. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds I'd good like to me. Like, I'd like to thank all my guests. And once again, you've been listening to A Better Talk production. You can find it on YouTube at Better Teach. And please follow, sign, uh, sign up and all this sort of type of thing. You can hit notification buttons, I've been told. Uh, thank you to my guests. And I'm sure we'll all speak again. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.